Okay. Um, if you haven't, if you're not aware of who Mike Atkins is, he's a minister of 43 years in our community. He's been at our church. He'll be here tomorrow, actually, at church. And uh, he and I uh, had extensive conversations about these weekends. And um, we went back and forth on how to do it. Uh, he's written a book called The Life of Christ in the Heart of a Man. And uh, I suggest, strongly suggest, um, that you get a copy of this book from Kim, who's in the office. She has, he's bringing with him tomorrow, I think, 50 copies. So get a copy from Kim. I don't know what it costs. Anyway, he's got another book uh, that has to do with um, um, the, uh, the next track. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Ken McKim, where's Ken? He's passing out the papers in the back. Ken leads a small group on Sunday mornings uh, called Growing in Christ. And uh, we have found this to be uh, good material, very solid material. And this will be something that uh, will become a, continue to be a part of the foundation track, okay? Firming up a good foundation track. But you'll, you'll hear more about this as we go. Uh, what I really want to do is you identify your track and then get started between now and Christmas. And what does that mean? That means start your memory, scripture memory, appropriately, do the supplemental reading, and, and some of these offerings will begin to be available in December, but come January, you're going to hit the ground running with a good plan. So this isn't the last time we're going to talk about this by any means, but um, we're just getting you started, okay? So those two books are important. I do want to thank, I don't want to thank Kim because she's not in here right now, so we won't do that. Okay, I had a question at the break. When convenient, this is convenient, what is over-spiritualization? Example, good question. Uh, I've made this, I make this comment every once in a while, and a lot of people don't like it, but I'm trying to make a point. Uh, sometimes it's better to not be liked to make a point than not make a point and be liked. Uh, well, you and I are not called to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. What does that mean? It means that our faith, our beliefs, ought to be useful and applicable to everyday life. They ought to be centered in scripture and wisdom. And there are a lot of spiritual extremes, and we're going to get into some of those in this section. Spiritual extremes um, are problematic because of the motivation behind them. Spiritual extremes uh, usually meet an unmet need in a person's life. Um, in their soul, their mind, their will, their, their personality, their self-esteem. People will go to spiritual extremes to compensate for a deficiency in who they see themselves to be. And then you're always having to one-up yourself, okay? The soul looks at two things, and, and maybe more. Size is real important. If something's big, it's better. If there's a lot of it, it's better. And we can approach things with more is better, more spirituality is better, over-spiritualizing is better, and then we can be real sincere about it. So if we're in sincere in our intentions and we're seeking God, we're, we're focused on size and sincerity, but we're, to the expense of the source. See, not everything that is spiritual or that we, that we say we've heard from God and we've done this, not everything is from the source. Sometimes it can come out of our own soulishness. It can be half right. It can be quarter right. It can be three-quarter right. But never negate the source, which has to be the Zoe life. We're going to keep hammering here while we're here. And size and sincerity. So over-spiritualization to the person who asked oftentimes compensates for a perceived deficiency in our own self. In other words, it makes us more important. I see this in Pentecostal circles. The baptism of the Holy Spirit to these old timers was like a notch in their belt, some sort of um, uh, evidence of their spiritual experience, M missing, missing the source and the purpose. Uh, the, the source and the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit ought to take somebody to a place of deep humility 
serious boldness and extreme joy. But we've, we take it and make it a soulish thing, an accomplishment or something, and that's not cool. So I'm very, uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm very guarded about over-spiritualizing things at times. And sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll use humor. Over-spiritualization can cause you problems in your relationships because people just don't get it. It causes a problem between a husband and a wife. Oftentimes, I see that often. Uh, parents and their children, and the parents are the last to figure it out. The children are the last to say anything. And you don't, Jesus didn't operate this way. He, he stepped away from attention. He made himself nothing. He was under the radar. He wasn't out bragging about what was going on. Or he wasn't speaking and, and give. He didn't need makeup. God does not need makeup. Okay? I used to have a youth group, and I said, like, when you come to this youth group, I'm, I'm not going to put makeup on God. What does that mean? I'm not going to sell you on a million different recreational things every Wednesday and beg you to worship God or listen to the Bible for 10 minutes. But I will tell you, uh, I'll, I'll tell some teenagers sitting in the back, hey, we're about to worship. Why don't you take your hat off? <laughs> I will say that because we're going to create a, a place of reverence here, right? So <clears throat> this has a... It, over-spiritualizing has as at its core a motivation, and it's usually attention-getting or draw attention to self. How many of you saw that preacher that got robbed while he was preaching, and the figures differ? It was a half a million dollars worth of jewelry. Somebody said a million. This guy had robes, and under his robes, he had these gaudy chains and stuff. Okay, well, he's over-spiritualizing. He's, he's drawing never, ever, or anything that we say in a spiritual realm ever should draw attention to ourselves. I shouldn't stand up in a pulpit and look like a, a hobo, nor should I stand up there with half a million dollars worth of jewelry on. That's ridiculous on both extremes, right? These 12 different Rolexes, and the guy's got bad posture because he's wearing this gold bling. I mean, come on, Right? And now he's being sued by an old woman in his congregation who he built out of $92,000 of her life savings. Okay. Overcompensating, over-spiritualizing, over-monetizing, over-anything. Anything after over is no good, especially overloaded. Okay, a uh, question about obedience. How, where does obedience come into all of these things? Well, that's a good question. Obedience is the result of love. Jesus says, you, love, you obey me because you love me. If you're obeying with the absence of love, you're on the wrong track. You're, you're heading the wrong direction. You're, gonna, you're not going to obey enough to feel loved because your motivation is wrong. So it's like uh, last Sunday I was uh, talking about the kindness of God leads us to repentance, right? There you go. So God has this kindness towards us that draws us to repentance. We have a love for him that draws us to obedience. We don't obey to be loved. We obey because he loves us. We, we repent because he's kind to us, not because he's an ogre. Now, uh, someone, someone else made a comment like, I already know I don't need to see, others see the other three tracks. I'm just an, an, I'm in elementary school on all of this thing. There's absolutely... Nothing wrong with that. In fact, um, if you wanted to look at these four areas and say that those who are living under the lordship of Christ are the most mature, they would be the ones who are truly under the lordship. They would be the ones that would come back here and look for spiritual infancy in their own life. Nobody's arrived. Nobody's arrived. This is... see. To, to put a hierarchy or, a, um, or an emphasis or overemphasize any one of these at the expense of the other, to judge any of these areas or anyone in them is here, is soulish. It's soulish. Um, you are where you are, and you don't want to be anywhere else. And you certainly don't want to be a poser in the wrong track, right? Okay, that's very, that's very uh, 
healthy way to look at it. Okay, so let's go through this. We're, now we're going to talk about freedom in Christ. How about that? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Freedom. Uh, if you look at, uh, some of you really like, I remember Rebecca Catherine one time talking about Isaiah 61. She was hanging out there one time, and I thought, man, that's a great passage. Um, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Uh, he's come to set the captives free. Recovery of sight for the blind. The ministry of Jesus is in many, many, many respects centered in on freedom. Uh, and, and the timing in which he came to this earth during a time of deep oppression ought to tell us something, that he came to set the captives free. He didn't try to change the oppressor. He tried to change the hearts of the oppressed and set them free, which is interesting. Um, so freedom is at the very high priority for him, and it should be for us. And why is it should be a, a priority for us? Because freedom from our own lust of the flesh and appetites and base primal desires, fatigue, health issues, sickness, blah, we don't want that drive in our life. I want to be free of that. I had the privilege of ministering to a woman who had 35 or 40 chemo treatments, and I probably talked to her 15, 20 times during that process. That woman taught me more about being sick than anybody I've ever met. She turned sickness into a ministry. She showed me how to suffer and she did it without complaining. That was a, it was an incredibly rich time for me to, and supposedly I was ministering to her, that's a joke. So she wasn't ruled by her body and it was wasting away. While it wasted away, she was glorifying Christ in earnest. She wasn't, she had some opinions on the whole thing. I'm sure she didn't like it. She didn't want it. And she felt terrible physically and emotionally. And she was deeply grieving over her husband and how he would actually make it through a week without her. <laughs> but this, this right here was free as a bird. This, her spirit and her communion with God was so rich. It almost was so rich, I don't even know how to say this, if God actually healed her, it, it, it would seemingly break the intimacy she had with him. That's how, how, how uh, deep it was. Okay, but she was free, though nothing around her necessitated or gave reason for anyone to say she was free. If anybody looked at her and said she was, there's no way that woman can be free. She was as free as anybody I've ever met. I've had the privilege of ministering in prisons in the United States and, and in India. There are people in prison that are freer than people that are out. That's no joke. I mean liberated, free. There are people in the recovery program that I speak at that have been there long enough in their year's time there that they've experienced a freedom from this world and the stresses of this world and the responsibilities of this world. They're now beginning to taste and see that God is good and they're gonna to have to go back out into this world and try to maintain that freedom. So freedom is, is important because if we're free from this and free from this, then we can be empowered here, emboldened here, enhanced here, filled here, used here for God's glory. And God can work through us. Now, if we're in bondage, we limit God working through us. We really do. And our bondage let's use bondage and we'll, we'll get specific, can cause us sickness. It can cause us sickness and it, worse yet, it can slow if not stymie, if not block healing, physical healing. When James says in James 5, 16, uh, call the elders of the church, anoint the sick with oil, pray the prayer of faith. It says, confess your sins one to another. Okay, what is that? You have your sin, I have mine. You confess yours before God, I confess mine before God. 
But at times, there's a need for you and I to confess our sins one to another. And why would that be? Because they're relational sins, because they sins that come between two people, between a brother and a sister, between this, you know, between a husband and a wife. When you confess those sins, not just to God, but to the, your partner, your spouse, your, what, your children, whatever the case may be, those are the things that the follow up with healing. So the problem is, if we don't have a freedom to do that in our life, and we have this bitterness, a root of bitterness, or, or deception, or unforgiveness, that's hindering our physical healing. Why else would he put it in the passage? That's hindering. If we have, if we, if we have offenses against somebody, or, or harboring resentment, that's hindering healing. Because it's the confessing of those sins that actually leads to healing in James 5. Okay, so freedom is of the utmost importance because it allows God the freedom to work in any area of our life, not disinvite him or block him or stymie him. You know, he only goes where he's welcome. And unfortunately, the devil's the same way. He only goes where he's invited. So let's not invite him. See, that freedom is important. Uh, and, and Jesus is, is, makes it a focal point of his ministry. The ultimate freedom, I guess, is from sin, is salvation, right? And the, but we're never free of the consequences of sin. You see, uh, we're forgiven of our sin, but God doesn't totally keep us from the consequences of the sin. You can eat... Uh, Three coconut cakes a day and gain 500 pounds and ask God for the forgiveness of gluttony. But once you ask for forgiveness, you're not going to wake up in the morning 400 pounds lighter. You still carry the consequences of your sin with you. Okay? So, freedom is very important. Can I get an amen? All right. So, um, so we're going to use like some vernacular here. I like the idea of breaking strongholds and removing footholds. I'd like that better than the word deliverance. Um, deliverance assumes too often, just by the way it sounds, that the source of the problem is demonic in nature. Well, it may be oppression, but if you're a believer, it's not possession. Okay? <clears throat> so what I'm getting at is this. Another example of over-spiritualizing is this. The, how many remember Flip Wilson? <laughs> Honey, I was acting like I didn't remember, and you raised your hand, so now I'm dated. We're dated. You and Bob Taylor. And, and, uh, all right. And his, what was his thing? The devil made me do it. All right, that's not true. <laughs> the, the, the deliverance vernacular and the demonic giving, sometimes we give credit to the demonic that it's not due, right? And sometimes we give credit to the demonic so as to absolve ourselves of personal responsibility. So what are you, what are you a pawn? You have no say-so? That's not scriptural. You have authority to trample scorpions and demons. So... This idea that we need deliverance because the devil's involved in my life. Well, one, you probably invited him. And two, he doesn't really have the power you think he does. And three, you're responsible for your own actions, right? Come on. So there's freedom. So the ways to freedom um, are varied. So let's take a look. We're going to introduce a biblical worldview by considering areas of conflict. Now, we're going to look... In a few minutes, it's, I think, seven areas of conflict. There are others. You now have an index card at your, in front of you, I think. If you have anything from the first session that you think would be appropriate for you to glean up, write those things down, and then on this section, if we come across something, say, yeah, that sounds like, or it maybe not, it's not even a personal issue of yours, but you know people who are dealing with it, and they aren't here, and it's a prevalent thing, write that down. It's helpful to know. So these areas of conflict we need to be aware of and we need to work through a beginning understanding regarding how God's ways differ 
from our own. In other words, God's got a way of dealing with that particular issue, and it may be different than what we are accustomed to or we think is his method. And introduce a process of how to stand in spiritual authority. Now, uh, there are two sermons that, when preached, elicit a different response from people than two, any other two subjects. And one is, any sermon properly delivered on the blood of Christ has an effect on people and their response is different than any other sermon of any other topic. The second one uh, has a similar effect, in it, but it has the effect because people deeply want to know, one, that they have it, and two, how to use it. And that's spiritual authority. You, the, the disciples were what? Ordinary, unschooled men, but they noted they had been with Jesus. Saul was a brainiac. Remember the knowledge thing. The ordinary, unschooled men had a spiritual authority that was not based on academia. When Jesus spoke, Mark 1 and 22, he spoke not as of the teachers of the law, but as one who had authority. So authority <clears throat> is of premium importance in a believer's life to know how to use it, to know, one, that you have it. It's accessible to you in Christ. In fact, it's not that you have it apart from him. It's that you have Christ who is the authority in you. we got to figure out how to release it. Him, not it. Okay? Authority is huge. When you take authority and put it together with the blood, now we're really getting somewhere, especially in prayer. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Okay? Authority. I would say that the body of Christ is the least utilized resource on the face of the earth when maximized would change the world. And I would also say that would only happen through a recognition and an implementation and a release of the authority of a believer. And the first thing we have to understand about authority, and I'm talking about authority because some of what we're talking about here is bondage from oppression and darkness. Okay? Authority is really only active in a person's life if, in fact, they submit to authority. Jesus had authority, unlike the teachers of the law, because all he ever did was submit to his father. And because he submitted to his father, he had authority. He didn't have authority because they just said, you're God and you have it. He demonstrated the submission. Now, what is the difference between submission and obedience? Two different things. In a soulish kind of way, obedience without love is gritting your teeth and doing what you're told because the person who told you is your boss or has something on you or provides for you in some way, or you're a parent and your kid does what you tell him to do because you're his parent and he doesn't really like it and he'll let you know or she'll let you know they don't like it. So you're actually asking someone to do some, something as an authority figure, and the person actually does it, but unwillingly, not feeling good about it, in a very soulish manner, they perform and make their bed like you told them or asked them to do. That's obedience without love. We obey Christ out of love, okay? Submission it's a totally different ballgame altogether. Submission is, I'm going to go make my bed at age eight because my mom asked me to do it and because I respect her and I don't want anything to come between us. I am willingly, my spirit is in charge, my desire is coming in line with my spirit and I'm going to do it because she's my mom and I respect her, I love her, and my bed's a mess. Okay? Submission to authority is that God has placed this person in my life. Just like the father was in the son's life, 
and this person is supposed to have my best interest in mind, and they're asking me to do something, like memorize 10 scriptures. <laughs> First thing I would ask is, are they doing it? Second thing I would say, if they have my best interest in mind, and I may not feel good about it, I may not want to do it, and I might think it's stupid, but I'm going to do it, that's submission to authority. So you don't do it in like some rebellious way, right? Some sarcastic way. That person has authority because they've demonstrated that they've already released it. That authority was evident in their life, in the situation. So now they have it. You know it's there because you can see it. Okay? If you want to have spiritual authority over oppression and um, darkness and uh, all these other things, then in your prayer life, you have evidence of submission to God's authority. That's the lordship of Christ. That's the, four, that's the final track. Over-spiritualizing things, as long as we're on that track, is if you've got an intercessor that just going... Over-spiritualizing would be like babbling like a pagan on the street corner and just... I've seen it before. You're casting out demons. You're bringing down strongholds. You're pulling down Ephesians 6. You're like a warrior out there. You're, play, you're praying over principalities and geopolitical movements across Europe and the Middle East. That's great. Don't put yourself out there if you're not submitting to authority, though. You, you, you get your hand cut off. You draw back a... A real problem, because you're putting yourself out there, you've got to have submission to authority. Just, that's not a joke. You don't play around that kind of stuff. All right, so submission. That, that's all part of the freedom thing. All right, so this worldview that God has is we're going to get into these areas of conflict. That's what he's saying. And we're going to process this. All right, now, let's look at these seven areas of conflict in your sheet there. Counterfeit versus real. The one, the one thing I don't like about talking about freedom before the track on the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit, one of the gifts of the Spirit is discernment and discernment of spirits. That is, we were just talking a few minutes ago, that is incredibly important in the world in which we live in today. Um, There's two things going on in our world today. Well, three. There's an abundance of lies and deception from all areas of life. There's the globalization of our faith, the dilution of Christianity by the, by the uh, exposure to all world religions. The Internet's kind of helped us with that. There is the, uh, the dilution of world religions because of the intermixing of different faiths. And, and people are now having choices to make. And there is the, the deconstruction of a young person's faith and having serious questions about what they believe. And if they're not provided with the answers, then typically they'll move towards deconversion. Okay? All of that's going on in this world because of dis a lack of discernment. We can't tell, really, what's counterfeit and what's real. All right. If something originates in the darkness, it's counterfeit. Okay? There's three parts of us. We've been over that. There's three parts of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's three parts of the darkness, the, the, God, the, the evil of the false prophet, the Antichrist, and Satan. Satan's like the parallel to the Father, the Antichrist parallel to Christ, and the false prophet's parallel to the Holy Spirit. It's a counterfeit. There will be miracles that take place on this earth. I can't even imagine the absolute confusion that that could cause in the body of Christ if people aren't discerning. The miracle, false miracles are counterfeit. The, when Moses throws his staff down and turns it into a stake, it started there, counterfeit. And discernment is of the utmost importance in the, in, the, in the kingdom of God right now, and that's why the gifts of the Spirit need to be addressed as they relate to the discernment of spirits. My wife actually has that gift. It's very handy. Uh, 
to recognize something that looks a certain way, but in reality, its origin and its motivation is elsewhere, and, and it's dark. Okay? So, <clears throat> counterfeit versus real. Uh, you'll, you'll be duped with the counterfeit if, if one, we're, we're trying to glorify Christ apart from him, and we don't have that word in our heart, hidden in our heart. That, that will be catastrophic. Deception versus truth. In many ways, the same thing. Occasionally, I'll have an elderly woman come in my office and ask me whether or not I think it's a good idea for her to send like $50,000 to some guy on TV. And um, that kind of like really promises a huge payoff in like three years. Sincerity and size, but the wrong source. Right? That person is looking at the size of the payoff and the devotedness to Christ by sending so much of her own money. And she's so sincere in what she's doing. But the source is wrong. We get, we get way off base in this kind of stuff. Okay? Bitterness versus forgiveness. We, we do talk from time to time in, uh, from the pulpit about a root of bitterness. That kind of uh, oppression, self-induced oppression, um, it, it's going gonna, it, gonna to get you here. It really is. It's going to end up eating your, it'll eat your organs. I don't, I'm not even being facetious. It, it'll eat you up. It'll eat your bones, Proverbs says. We, we are not a people, we, we have a higher calling than other people have, and we can't harbor these things. So uh, th th um, here's, here, here's what I'm saying. We just hit on something that if you're struggling with, you don't have the luxury of putting that off. You don't, you, you don't have the luxury of saying, it's like uh, the plague of frogs, the frogs, my Wife hates frogs. I'll be done talking about them in a second. Huh? <laughs> the, the frogs come to the Pharaoh. They're like everywhere. They're in the cupboards, right? And Moses goes to him, all right, is, is it, you ready? I mean, you, you ready to repent? And he goes, I'll let you know in the morning. So basically, what the Pharaoh's saying is, I want one more night with the frogs. I'll let you know in the morning. I'm going to have the frogs one more night. I'll let you know in the morning. Well, bitterness... <clears throat> And these things like this, unforgiveness, it's like a blue light special, man. We got to deal with that right away because it's a domino effect. That bitterness is like a little leaven that goes through the whole batch of dough. It starts to affect your, your thoughts, your desires, your emotions, how you feel. It makes you more carnal. You're, you're ashamed of it. You know it's there. You're repressing it. We don't need it. We don't need another night with the bitterness. We don't need another night with the frogs. That would be the thing that we really need to deal with. Unforgiveness and bitterness are biggies. Pride versus humility. What is the number one indicator of maturity in Christ? Maybe the top three. Certainly love. That's always the answer. You always answer love on a test if you're taking about Christianity. And if you're taking a test on geology, you always put down erosion. <laughs> you're always right. Um, humility. Maturity is humility, and humility is teachability. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. There's no more maturity than that, to give up your life for someone that you love. It, it, that is the pinnacle, uh, humility. So pride, then, would be the absence of freedom. Don't go too far with that, though, because, listen, I don't know the address right offhand, but Paul says something in, the, in one of his epistles about being proud of what's been accomplished. That's okay. Let's not go there. Let's not be so self-deprecating that we can't say, you know what, I actually did a pretty good job on that. What's wrong with that? If you, <laughs> how do you love your neighbor? 
as you love yourself. Well, if you're always beating yourself up, even though you're doing something really cool, you don't like your neighbor much, do you? Right? So let's, let's be kind to ourself. That's a different kind of pride. This is a haughtiness, an arrogance, a superiority. Okay? All right. Bondage versus freedom. Well, we've been on about that. And curses versus blessings. A curse, <clears throat> uh, generational curse. Sometimes we get into this uh, subject of freedom and someone brings up a generational curse. Well, I'm going to give you my take on it. You, you, you take it or shake it, really. I mean, Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for Gary Hewins. And by doing so, he broke every curse. And, and I belong to him, and I'm in the palm of his hand. I don't have to worry about curses. First of all, I don't have to worry. And I don't have to worry about being cursed by some weird religion in, of some jungle that I've been in. I don't have to worry about that. I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. But what the curse curses from, from, the, from generations is is an absence of God's blessing, not a punitive curse from the darkness. If, if we're not careful, we're going to take what we've been taught, what we've been conditioned to think and feel and learn about our upbringing or anything else that, that causes us to experience an absence of God's blessing in that area of our life. That's where we start to renounce those things and forgive those who hurt us. Now we're not having to deal with those consequences anymore. I don't suffer the consequences of my ancestors' sin. My sin was paid for on the cross, as was yours. My great-grandfather's actions have nothing to do with whether or not I'm okay today, right? I'm covered by the blood, as are you. Therefore, uh, I can have an absence of God's blessing if I've taken something in my mind or my desires or my feelings about my past and say, yeah, I'm concerned about that. I give it power. I give it authority by dwelling on it instead of renouncing it, breaking myself off from that, and then move on with my life. Some people are like destined to never have anything because Uncle Bill was a jerk. So I, I don't look at it that way. Curses are not that way. Curses are the absence of God's blessing because we allow these things to become important to us. We make them something they're not intended to be. Yeah. It's okay, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I have an addiction issue with alcohol in my family. I, have a, I believe I have a genetic predisposition. Okay. Not unlike someone in this room might have a genetic predisposition to, God forbid, breast cancer or something. Okay. I also have, uh, I also have things modeled for me in my childhood that I have to make a decision when I came to Christ. Is that is that more powerful than the cross I just came to? Does that follow me? Do I do I empower that? Is that my identity? Is that an area that's cut off from God's grace? I have to make those decisions. I have to be aware of that. So it's a nature-nurture thing. But in a spiritual sense, Christ died on the cross for me and demonstrated his love for me. While I was yet a sinner, he died for me. And the work was so complete, so perfect, so thorough, that it covered all these other things. It wasn't, like, incomplete. He didn't get a B minus because I have this thing in my family that's now haunting me. It's not that way at all. So I have to learn from where I came from. I can't empower things over my own life. I have to take responsibility for my own decisions, and I have to have the life of Christ in me and not do something for him. I could try to live a life for Christ without him in me and releasing him in us, and then I probably will have some thoughts, some doubts, some desires, and some feelings about it. This happens a, a lot with abused women who's, who are now a, a remarry abused abusers, okay? As though we somehow have to continue this, or codependency is another one, we have to continue this identity when in reality we don't. 
the freedom that Christ wants is thorough and complete. Okay? That's a good question. All right, next steps. Um, let's look at our handout. Everybody get their handout? Everybody but me. Can I borrow yours again? I'm sorry. All right, there's your memorization. We went over that. All right, here's some, here's some self-assessment. And, and if you don't get the answers now, take it home and be still and think about it. Do I experience more anxiousness at the expense of peace? What a, this is always a good question to ask yourself every now and again, certainly every year. What in my life needs to be eliminated? What in my life needs to be enhanced? And what in my life needs to be expanded? That is very important. We ask that question of ourselves in the church at CBC every year. What do we need to eliminate? Was not working? What do we need to enhance, make it better? And what new areas do we need to expand in? Ask yourself that question. You're going to find probably more freedom in your answers than you realize. Do I harbor unforgiveness or resentment? Do I need to address any addiction issues? Do I have a recurring sin? Do I have a recurring sin, a stronghold, easily entangled and besetting you? Do you have a sin that's calling the shots? That's something you fought probably for a long time. It won. You hated it. And now you've come to accept it on some level. That's a stronghold. Do I have a poor relationship with authority? We went through that. Am I spiritually burnt out? Spiritual burnout is a result of not having Christ at the source but having too much of our own self at the, at the source of what it is we do and why we do it. Do I need to address procrastination today? That was funny. Yes. This is the second one. Oh, here it is. Okay, I got it. Okay, procrastination. Why do you procrastinate? It's a good question. That's bondage. Do you have a biblical perspective on spiritual warfare? Am I more planless? And if so, is this painful? If you don't have really have a plan, uh, what are you doing? What are you doing? So freedom, and, there's bondage in the absence of a goal and a plan and intentionality. Do I lack mission or purpose? Am I too avoidant? Do I deflect? Uh, do I repress feelings to my own detriment? Is there an absence of renouncing things in my life? This is a powerful word, renouncing. Underline that one. To renounce. Um, uh, too often, uh, in a moment, we'll come to the altar and we'll, we'll, we'll act upon something that was preached or taught or something. Or in a ladies' Bible study, you'll be, it'll be a hot topic and you'll address it. Uh, we, we tend to have, most people have a tendency to kind of like do a, like a one and done thing. It's better to slow down and if you hit on something that, and that's causing you bondage, it's better to hit on it and stay there, linger. Uh, that's another thing. This church does not linger at the altar. I haven't figured that out yet. I'm trying to figure it out. Lingering means don't move on immediately. Don't, don't buy into this drive-through Christianity right? This instantaneous thing. Settle in. If, you, if you've been bound up by some kind of unforgiveness for 25 years, get, could you give it more than 25 seconds? <laughs> okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Do a word study. Park yourself. Go pray with somebody and pull out this powerful word. I renounce that in the name of Jesus. I renounce it. I mean, I would say that if it was a prevalent thing in my own life, I'd be saying that for weeks. Every time I stopped at a stop sign, if I did stop at a stop sign, I would say, I renounce that. It's a powerful word. It's a, rehearse what it is we're doing here. We, we, get, we get to one and done on things. You know what I mean? Um, improper relationship with the past, a soulish walk. Um, oh, this is great. Do I mind my own business? That will cause you all kinds of bondage. <laughs> Patty's laughing. Uh, 
1 Thessalonians 4 and 11, to make it your ambition to, mind your own, to live a quiet and peaceful life and mind your own business. Don't talk too, do I talk too much? Some people talk so much and there's a reason. What are they hiding? Uh, do I have anger issues? Do I tend to be critical, critical or negative or complain? Is there a bitter root growing within me? Think of a bitter root, if you really want to get some motivation to get rid of it, think of a bitter root as a four-foot-long tapeworm. <laughs> now you're going to do something. That's the whole Freedom in Christ track. Um, read a book. Counsel with somebody who's been down that road. See, put some emphasis on that thing. It needs to be handled. 30, do I lie? 28, is codependency an issue? Can I be condemning and judging of others? Do I struggle with compulsive behaviors? Am I depressed too often? I think we should all be depressed from time to time. Jesus was. Give yourself some slack, right? But is it a way of life? Do I have, we got to deal with that medically, spiritually. Something's got to happen. Do I have a poor body image? Do I have an unhealthy relationship with food? I use it as a medication. Where in my life do I exercise poor stewardship? There's all kinds of areas. Now, listen, um, those who were at the first weekend are shalom ministers. You, we're going to have opportunities to mentor, to lead groups. Some of you are going to be teaching this that I'm doing right now. We have all kinds of opportunities as we get this thing launched. But that's the freedom in Christ. Any questions? Um, Jesus is the one who was and who is and is to come. When our past has an undue amount of influence on our present and our future, it's out of balance. We don't need to deny that we had a past or we had difficulty in our past. We don't need to romanticize it or glorify it either. Okay? We don't need to exaggerate it. That's an improper relationship. We don't need to take our sin and glorify it and make ourselves look good because we came from so far down, right? Realize it, it's there. Christ owns it and paid for it. Don't let it cost you your present. And, and because if it costs you your present, it's costing you your future. It's, it's hindering your future. And in your past, not yours in particular, but in our past, we have trauma, Statistically, 25% of us have abuse. We have hurt. We have pain. We have shame. There's some powerful things back there. And the relationship we need to have with those things, Christ died on the cross to scorn our shame. I asked somebody, that, well, I asked somebody in this room, you know, why don't you consider this opportunity coming up? And the person gave me immediately 85 reasons why she wasn't worthy of it. But all of that took place back here. All things old have passed away. All things have become new, right? Now, I mean, you can take that too far, but you get the idea. If you're ruled by your past, you're not ruled by Christ. You and I should be subject to nothing and no one but Christ and the proper authority he has in our life. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. You and I are subject to no one except Christ and the proper authority he's put in our life. Now, we're not subject to a sickness. We're not subject to a label. We're not subject to uh, trauma. That's freedom. And it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. All right. It comes down to what is the source? What, what's your motivation? 
you can share a testimony and actually throw Christ a bone, <laughs> like acknowledge he was involved. You can give him all the glory. Or on, on some continuum, you can actually make yourself out to look like a real overcomer, right? So the heart of the matter is not to glorify the past in such a way like I did this, I overcame. Not even to meet in the middle and say, Christ, help me a little bit. But you give him all the glory, all of it. You and I can do nothing apart from Christ. You don't really want to either. If you had the opportunity to do everything with him and nothing without him, why would we choose to do anything without him? Right? So all of these, all of these are, t like again, we're not going to get this resolved in one hour. All of these touch on various areas for which we need a greater level of freedom. Okay? Yes? Oh, I see a lot of uh, I see a lot of um, this happening, and it grieves me. Tuesday we talked about this endless myths and genealogies. There's this. There's a lot of um, theories that are holding way too much weight on some people's lives at the expense of the truth. Start with the truth, and then have your theory, and even have your own opinion. But don't make your opinion or your theory trump. That's not the right word. I mean to say that. Uh, don't, let, don't let what you don't clearly know hinder what you know. Okay, that's over theorizing. If I said I want to talk to you about the theory of evolution, you, told, you would say to me, yeah, but that, at the end of the day, it's a theory. Well, we can't embrace theories in our own culture today at the expense of truth. Nor can we say they're true when we don't know they are. We, we lose our credibility. It's just something to be aware of. I'm not up here telling people what to think or what their opinion should be about certain matters, but I am, I am telling them what they should be about the truth, and you ought to have a greater confidence in that than you do theories. That's just easy to figure out. Yes? He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Um, he felt... Empathetically and compassionately, he felt the sorrow of those he ministered to in addition to, and this goes on today, and we'll talk about this this afternoon, you and I can grieve the Spirit of God. So you can see how Jesus has a man of sorrows acquainted with grief in his ministry in person to people. Now the Spirit of God can grieve out of our own distance, our own. He hurts for us, he hurts with us, and he hurts in us, and he hurts through us, ideally. We want to get to the point where he's hurting, and we're hurting because he's hurting through us compassionately. That's true ministry at that point. Yeah. So to say that Jesus was always happy is, is, is not true. You can't live in a broken, fallen world and love people who are suffering and be happy about it. That's just weird, okay? So we have to keep it real. That's a good question. Hey, Kim, I got down a minute early. Should we just wait? What do you want to do? All right, Gene, would you pray over a meal?